kickoff's eight o'clock. I'm sitting there, and they go to a commercial break. They come back, and all there is is a blank screen. Are with you kidding? Guys. They did it in right before the game started. Oh One my minute before god! The game. Seven fifty nine, right before that tip. is crazy. That is so incredibly and, stupid. And I'll tell you, I did a lot of research on this shit. I talked to some dudes that work at Spectrum. Supposedly, really? at Spectrum had a bullshit deal that was ridiculous, and Disney uh-huh. said, "Fuck you." purposes only. You'd be an idiot to listen to anything these degenerates say. Invest at your own risk, do research, but seriously don't listen to these ass clowns. Now enjoy Cash Daddies. Welcome to Cash Daddies. We're banking fatties. And I think, I think if I'm correct, this show got up to 100 and I think 46 or 36 on the top 200 financial podcast on Apple and finances in the United States. Congratulations. Joining me on this very successful podcast. Somewhat, not really, but you know, we're just staying in the pocket. We should get Uh, t-shirts. We should get t-shirts. We are number 134. That would be great. We are number 134. Join me from New York. Howie Dewey and then ones and twos. uh, Jay Nice, Johnny Woodard and Carl. All right, guys, hey, no. welcome. Welcome yourself. What's going on, man? I'm just chilling, dude, trying to be a young Christian warrior, trying to enjoy life. That's what it's all about, baby. That's what... really what it's all about. So how much of the Cash Daddy's money this week are we going to donate to Oprah in the Rock in Hawaii? By the way, real quick, the number was 138. We, were number one we should get that in foam. You know how they have it in foam fingers, like number one. We should get yeah. one, we three. Should, we are number 138. Eight. One, 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 three, eight. Eight. one, one thirty eight. One thirty eight. I think we're the equivalent of UNLV football in podcasting. Mm-hmm. That's the equivalent. North Carolina, number sixteen right now in the coaches' poll. Oh snaps, yes. Johnny! Let's go. They put it on South Carolina, man. That was a surprise. Johnny's winning. Johnny's teams win. Johnny's got a, it was a good a, week. Do not. It was a good he week. Great, he got a good quarterback. He's a good He's quarterback. The best, yeah. It's him and that yeah. guy in Southern California. I feel, like there's, guys. I feel like this year, there's like a lot of good quarterbacks. More than there's, like There's definitely USC, two that are great. Yeah. UNC, Colorado. That guy's really good. I think there's some good He's not. He's not. In Notre class, Dame's so good. Guys. Um, the guy Oregon State's good. I mean, there's Michigan. Michigan. The kid last night at Duke is nasty. That kid's good. Yeah, I, I just now, don't know Johnny, how good Clemson is. We'll, we'll see. That's going to be interesting. Does Duke does Duke play UNC in football the way they play them basketball? Once a season, always. Yeah. Okay. All right. That should be an interesting one. That should be an interesting. We almost always beat them, though. I mean, we always beat them. It's nearly the every first, time. First week of NFL football. Which I like to call it the the Las Vegas Raiders Super Bowl, okay? Because <laughs> we get one game and then and then our season's over. Yeah, and that's how it goes. I'm excited about it. First game, let's go! Uh, college football's going. I'm excited. I'm excited for all of it. It's uh, it's a great time of year, man. September is the beginning of like I I really love the yeah. next two months for sports. Best. I'll be it. MetLife Stadium, Monday night, September 11th, uh, for the Jets-Bills game. I will be there. That's going to be a crazy game. Crazy game. September 11th, sold out. It's going to be nuts. So uh, I'm very excited because, you know, then on September 27th is the NBA training camp starts. And the reason I'm excited because I'm going to do DraftKings this year and try to do some of these daily fantasy leagues and see if Daddy can put a couple bucks do it. Make some money, man. Make I'm some trying. Money. I love basketball, dude. I, I, the way some people watch football, I watch basketball. I, I I scan the the box scores, checking for trends. Yeah, super computing it. So yeah, I love, I'm excited. I love the NBA. 
Fucking great. Uh, so where do you want to start, guys? How's your week? Where, where do you guys want to start? Let's start with Oprah and The Rock begging people to donate. Yeah, I, I agree with you, dude. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Their combined net worth is $2.8 billion, and they're asking people to send money. What the fuck? Yeah, I mean, they I, could snap their fingers and solve any totally money problems agree. that they're having there. Anything yes. that can be solved by money, they could fix in a week. I have, I lost all respect for The Rock, all of it, all of it. I mean, Oprah's Oprah, but The Rock. No, I, 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 Oprah's shady, and it's just ridiculous. And listen, to Oprah, you know, you got some real balls out there censoring the internet from anybody talking about you being you you being part of this whole thing but the fact that you're a billionaire and you're you haven't given a just t thrown a ton of money at this is absolutely ridiculous to me and i, I like the rock still i'm still a rock fan yeah uh, but it's, it, it's a bad look it, what they should open up is hi i've donated this amount of money and i've donated this money money yeah. amount of money could you please join us by making your own donation well they put in they they put in five mil each 10 million but from what everyone i've talked to says that the actual fund the money that they put in is not going to where it's supposed to be going does it never ever? does never does yeah no who knows they're probably fucking they're probably listening to Cash Dad. He's buying options next week with it. Who knows? I mean, there's that telemarketer show. I think I told you guys about it on HBO. And it's about, remember the police benevolent society? You would get that sticker on the back of your car and you thought it would get you out of like tickets or whatever. Yeah. 10% of that went to the cops. 90% yeah. of it went to the telemarketers who sold it in those companies. Well, Michael Jordan would do fundraising event in which like 5% of the money raised went to the actual cause. That's amazing. It's like unbelievable. Like, like there was this meme going around. It was like showed how much the CEOs of all these charities made. Oh. And it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. How's your week, guys? It's good week so far, man. We, you know, we had the day off in the markets yesterday. The market was down today. We got more volatility. Hopefully things will. I'm hoping the market sells off. Um, big news is oil. Fucking, if you listen to Cash Daddy's the last year and a half, two years, however long, and you listen to us and you bought right from the get-go, OIH or XLE, which we talk about every other week, oil and energy, oil and energy. It hit all-time high, all high today. Um, Saudi Arabia is cutting back on oil until January. Why? Million barrels per day. Why? Because they, they can. Because they can. They can I mean, we're already getting our dicks kicked in. Well, I mean, they're, they're cutting back, and that's why oil went through the roof today. Um, you know, oil and energy is still going to go higher and higher, and if you're invested in those two things, you're going to do well. Uh, hmm. But, yeah, Saudi cut, cut back on uh, production a million barrels a day. So that, that's a, that's quite a, a hike up until January 1st. Um, so look that's for a gas long price. time, dude. Look for gas prices to go up, and, again, uh, it has nothing. It doesn't matter who the president is, Congress. They have nothing to do with oil prices. It's it's overseas, man. You got to look at Saudi Arabia, baby. They control everything when it comes it's to oil. It's so crazy to me because don't we have oil? We're drilling a lot. Yeah, we drill every day in the United States. We've got tons. Um, so why don't we ever just say F you, Saudi Arabia? You know, that's, that's the uh, age-old question. I mean, and I'll tell you why, because Saudi Arabia is in hand in hand with the international banking couple and they deposit their money in there. So they want everyone to buy Saudi money. Here's so some stats. I got some stats for you. The U.S. does have enough to produce uh, to, to meet its own needs. According to the uh, Energy Information Administration, didn't know that existed. Uh, in 2020, America produced 18.4 million barrels of oil per day and consumed 18.12 million. And yet that same report reveals that we imported 7.86 million barrels of oil per day last year. We, we go through a lot of oil. No doubt about it. Um, yeah, we, we go through a lot of oil. And it just goes to show you that I don't think that, you know, I know EVs are big. They're, they're getting bigger, but we're decades away from from going full electric. Well, it doesn't help either because uh, most of them are 
powered by power plants that in some way rely on oil or Energy. some kind of yeah some kind yeah. of uh fossil fuel yep absolutely so uh yeah that's kind of bizarre um you know on the other hand they're talking about today that uh these countries outside the united states are are buying quite a bit of gold they're stocking gold uh a lot of countries outside the u.s so that just tells me it might be a good time to buy a little gold right now i mean it's dipped over the past few months it's down Damn. a little bit. might be a good time to buy some so i i look for gold to go up a little bit here's the here's the some of the reasoning for why we don't import i mean why we why we export and imp, why we export and import oil instead of just keeping it at home uh according to nasdaq uh, the economics are simple. Overseas oil, even after shipping costs, is often cheaper than domestically produced crude. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. I mean, well, I mean, OK, does it give any reason for that? Well, I know a lot of the oil we have is, you know, fracked or whatever. Fracking? And that okay. and that's that's, you know, that's a pretty labor and cost intensive, uh, you know, requires a lot of time. I mean, it's just and the offshore stuff, you know, the offshore stuff that we do here. I think it's a lot more difficult, you know, to get the oil cost wise than just, you know, just blows out of the ground in some places. Uh, let me see. Most of the oil produced in U.S. fields in Texas and Oklahoma and elsewhere is light and sweet compared to what comes from the Middle East and Russia. The problem is that for many years, imported oil met most of the U.S.'s energy needs. So a large percentage of the refining capacity here is geared towards dealing with oil that is heavier and less sweet than the kind produced here. What do you mean sweet? Like in terms of got a little sugar it's, to it? It's something to do with the constituent What am I ordering? Iced oil. coffee at Starbucks? Do you want the sweetener? It's the uh, viscosity. It, it's the viscosity levels. Is that what it is? Okay. Uh, sweet crude oil is a type of petroleum. Uh, it's and it's it's the 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 percentage of sulfur. So if it has 05 percent sulfur, it's technically sweet. There's also sour oil, and it's all just based on the sulfur in it. So there you go. Imagine the poor bastard's got to taste that. <laughs> Jesus. Sweet. Yeah. So Eating sweet. Oil, man, that's got to be rough. I've done that a few times, siphoning gas out of various oh, vehicles. Oh, yeah. Ugh, it's a bad taste. Oh, yeah, we're just oh, gonna... Hold on. When you when you were you were stealing oil? Gas? Well, not stealing it, yeah. but like sometimes you have a four wheeler that's out of yeah. gas, or you know you got one tank that's out, and you need to get it out of one tank and put it into another tank. You just siphon it, get a little hose, and then and until it, you know, and then you try not to let it hit your lips, but oh, it almost always. I, I got a whole mouthful one time. In college, oh, it's the worst. Huh? That's, that is the worst. Yeah, Ugh. yeah. Drink. You're Gross. drinking gas. You're literally drinking gas, man. Can't be good for so, you. So, have you guys seen? Uh, I, 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 I. I I don't know if you guys saw this, but I, I've locked my Twitter. I'm kind of over Twitter. It's just what you did. What now? You locked? It? I locked it. I put it on private. So oh, I, okay. I'm only on Twitter now, pretty much to get news stories because it's just, I don't know, man. It's just, it's just weird. It's Are you still weird. using your other account, official Tripoli, or is that one dead? I don't. I don't run. I I let Robin run that. Oh, that's good. So, okay, so, so you got one. Just, to, I got you. Yeah, that's smart. I'm not really in, I'm just, I don't know, man. Twitter's just isn't fun. It's just, it's, and it, it's not even the troll. I don't, the trolls are just stupid. Who cares about that? It's just, it's, there's things coming down with Twitter that I don't like. So it's what do like, you mean? well, you know, it's like, they really want to put your, your ID to your account. Well, then you, know, you for a while were saying that was a good idea, though. Well, I no, let me just explain myself. Okay, go ahead. That is great for getting rid of most of these trolls. Most of these trolls and bots will be gone because they won't put their name on their shit, right? Which is fine. But now you have it so the government has, you know, your name, official name attached to, to your Twitter, and then they know exactly what you're saying, which history has shown us. You don't want the government to be able to do that. We, you know, China, China has famously gave their citizens a hundred days to say whatever they want about the government. And then after the hundred days, they rounded up everyone who shit talked and took them out. So that's not good. So I've decided that I just, Twitter's just, it, it was good for a second and then it just lost it again. And as soon as this new CEO came in, it just got bad again. 
the whole reason I bring this up is that Elon Musk is going to has threatened to possibly sue the ADL. Yeah, yeah, the Anti Defamation League. Yeah, for labeling him a hate his platform a hate platform. And I think it's very interesting. And he's going to release all the documents of the ADL basically trying to control Twitter, which is insanity. There's been a lot of bad publicity for the ADL over the past couple of weeks, for sure. Well, I mean, like when you look at like things they've labeled as hate speech, it's like, uh, you know, white lives matter. It's okay to be white. The okay symbol. Like, it's just this is just stupid. And it's 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 gone beyond just like trying to stop anti-Semitism. Now it's just trying to get, you know, they went after Libs of TikTok and she's Jewish and we can get into. She like, is. Her. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, she's Jewish. And we can get Adam Green's talked about her connections to legacy media, but we can get into. Who cares if, if that's the product? Who cares what her connections are? I, the product is great. If you ask me, I love it. Yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, but the whole thing is that, like, why why are they trying to, why are they shutting down, why is Libs of TikTok uh, on the ADL's list of people that need to get shut down? When they're just pointing out, all they do is take TikToks yeah. and present them to everybody. Why is yeah. that? And that gets on the overreaching of everything. But it's going to be interesting to see, because, I, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't know what Elon Musk is doing right now with Twitter. And he's not doing anything with it. I'm not sure he does either, honestly. I mean, yeah, I feel I'm going like to be honest just... with you. Bringing in that woman has really wrecked. Well, I know his... why he did that. I can tell you why he did that. It was yeah, advertising. We all know, but you say it for yeah. the listeners. Yeah, advertising. I mean, it had to be done. Well, no, I'm, I'm telling you, it's I, the real reason is they... All the advertisers left when he bought the company. I, I've been reading like internal documents and stuff. All the advertising left because they were worried about, and there's a term for it. I can't remember what it is, but the term means they don't want to have their brand associated with the kind of tweets that were coming back to Twitter. So they didn't want an ad for Kellogg's cornflakes to be right next to some, you know, hillbillies racist joke or whatever, you know, just an example. Uh, so they all left. And apparently, the kind of the conditions for them bringing back the ads were that he had to bring someone that they recognized as, you know, a, a, a sort of a, what would you say, kind of a middle ground person, like a, you know, someone who's got right, experience right, running right, a company right. the way they like. It, it's very interesting because he talked about how the ADL does not have as much power in like Africa and he's crushing it in ads in Africa. Hmm. Like he says he's crushing it. That's so but interesting. In America, he doesn't. And this is just, again, black. This is just financial blackmail. Yeah. Well, that company's losing a lot of money. They're yeah. Not, they're losing. I money. get it. I mean, and, it's and, a failed and, business model. I've said this a thousand times. The way everybody celebrates Mark Zuckerberg, oh my God, he's doing jujitsu. Okay. What he's done to this country is like so dangerous. No, well, he's making money at least. Yeah, he's a good business. He, unlike Elon, he's crushing it because Meta is worth billions. Um, that's yeah, just. I see. I don't be- know because I just hear people talking about how Facebook is becoming more and more irrelevant. And well, it's not just Facebook. I mean, they, they own Instagram, Sam. I mean, they can, people can talk all they want, but they're wrong. All you gotta do is look at the numbers. Numbers don't lie. That company is an absolute juggernaut i mean it's a multi multi bill i want to say they got to be coming close to a trillion dollar market pipe yeah a lot of people use messenger and they have this facebook marketplace thing which is kind of like a cross between ebay and craigslist that a lot of people use now i mean it's huge that dude that stock, I mean, shit, it's like tripled since January 1st. It's um, crazy. Bro. Okay, we have the guests here. I just want to say really quickly before we bring him in. Uh, Elon, also, before we move off of him, did you see him this week? So, so this guy who's the CEO of Lucid, they found out, Rollinson is the guy's last name, he's making $397 million in compensation. Uh, is, that's what he made in 2022. So Elon tweeted out, again? he says, the CEO of Lucid, the EV company, the the you know the electronic vehicle company 
he received three hundred and seventy nine million dollars in in his compensation pa- package for twenty twenty two, which I mean is crazy. His base salary that's is five hundred. Company that's a six dollar. St- that's a garbage company. He got well three hundred seventy three million in stock awards is what he got. And so Elon tweeted out this week. He said, "Beware any company where leadership compensation is not linked to performance." Kind of targeting this guy, but three hundred seventy three million dollars. In stock awards alone, three hundred seventy-nine million was his total compensation. And a six-dollar stock at that, that company. It's crazy, was, right? Yeah, that's nuts. Anyway, uh, should we bring the guests in? Yes. Hey guys, I want to talk to you about our good friend James McMahon at Copy My Crypto. Guys, we've seen so many people make ridiculous money from crypto, but did you know it's easy for you to do the same? That's right. The Copy My Crypto membership site shows you the coins that YouTuber James McMahon personally holds and allows you to copy them. It's like having a big brother who knows what he's doing. You don't need to know a thing about crypto or how to invest as you simply do what he does. So let me tell you about James. He runs the Crypto with James YouTube channel, which despite heavy censorship has over 26,000 subscribers since March 2020. He sold his viewers to buy 26 crypto coins. Had you put 100 bucks in each, it'd be well worth over $123,000. Wow. Of the 26 coins, his top pick, coin called Phantom, went up 692 times from when he said. The, that one call alone has retired a number of people, including guys in their 20s and 30s. Remember, this is public knowledge. You can go to YouTube and verify this yourself. So if you'd like to join the 2,800 members at Copy James, then stop what you're doing and head over to copymycrypto.com slash Sam. That's copymycrypto.com forward slash Sam. That's S-A-M, okay? You'll not only find proof of everything I've said, but my listeners will get a Get full access for just $1. Once again, that's copymycrypto.com slash Sam. The recession is here. You can suffer like everyone else or choose to thrive. James is the real deal. Go visit the site now. All right, let's get into it. Very excited to have this guest on. We've been uh, trying to get him on the show. We finally made it happen. He has a great podcast called Turning Profit Podcast. Please welcome Peter Reese. How are you, Peter? I'm doing great. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. We love it. We're so thankful you are on the show. Uh, For our listeners who may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where our listeners can find you? Yeah, sure. Well, my uh, my background is real estate and real estate investing. So currently, and uh, this is this is kind of what's been consuming me over the past few years is I do land flipping. So. That just means we buy land off market and we sell it on market. That's a simplified version of it, but it's mostly all land. We just try to hold things very quickly and sell them really fast as for as much profit as we can make. So, um, and uh, we have our own podcast called Turning Profit Podcast. And, uh, you know, we talk all about land flipping there. That's awesome. Now, um, is that podcast available anywhere you listen to podcasts? Yeah, anywhere you listen. Yeah. And also we have, we post them on YouTube as well. So. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I love your background. It's amazing. Thanks. <laughs> the color scheme is great. Um, I, I'm thankful that you're on. Real estate something I've been really thinking about getting into. Fortunately, I live in LA and you know things are just ridiculous out here. But how did you get into real estate investing? Yeah, well, I'm down here in San Diego. Um, oh, snap. Been, yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous down here too. That's why I don't buy properties around here at all. Like We're buying stuff all over <laughs> the country. But Um, but what's cool is I've been, you know, I got involved in real estate, like a lot of people just kind of with buying our first home. And that was in two year 2000. So it's quite some time now, but we bought it with an FHA loan, which was three and a half percent down. And I think at the time the home price was about 200,000. So we were able to get in it pretty cheap (laughs) and, uh, yeah, so it worked out great. Our timing was great. Did some renovations on the home that were kind of questionable quality because I did them myself. But I thought I was a, a real estate mogul because that you know we made about fifty thousand dollars after we sold it after about two years. But I started getting in, getting into flipping homes way back then. Did um, you know uh, hired out a lot of the renovations, so the the quality started stepping up a little bit. 
And we were having a lot of fun with it. There was a lot of shows on HGTV and on TV that kind of got us hooked into the process. Got my broker's license after that. And I just started, you know, working for uh, for some clients. The market crashed here in uh, Southern California, as you know, in about 2008. And at the time, I was just dealing with foreclosure properties. I was an REO listing broker for the bank. So they would get all these listings of foreclosures and I would just help them, you know, sell the properties. Um, so, so, yeah. What were so, the properties going for before the crash? And what were they going for after the crash? Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of instances where I was showing clients homes before the crash, you know, in the 500, $550,000 range after the crash. 225, 250, I mean, like 50% off at least in a lot of these areas. And some areas are way worse than that. There was one property what that got assigned to me for, you know, as a being the by the bank, by the REO, uh, since I was an REO listing broker. And it was um, it was out in the Salton Sea, if you know where that's at. Like, you know, there was a big boom in that area, but then when the market crashed, it was really, really bad. <laughs> and I think the property ended up um it had sold like a year before brand new for like 276,000, which was cheap for Southern California. But, and then after it crashed, uh, ended up selling for like 60,000. Oh. So it was like 75%. What off. year was it, this? This is like 2008, 2009. Damn. Yeah. yeah it was crazy. Like, it was like that all over the country. I mean, if you want to find out exactly what happened, just watch the movie or read the book, The Big Short, because oh yeah, that's what happened. I mean, uh, you had literally neighborhoods in Atlanta in 2008 where you might have 15 to 20 houses in a, in a certain neighborhood. And out of those 15 to 20, 18 of them were, were upside down and done. And I mean, people, Sam, people were living in these houses, not paying any mortgage. The banks were screwed. The banks held all these properties. They had the notes. And people were just paying their uh, electricity or utility bills. And, and... They, I know, I know a guy that stayed in a house for like three years, rent free. These people were just, there were, there were thousands of squatters in Atlanta just living in these houses, and because there were so many foreclosures and bankruptcies, the banks were screwed. They, they didn't, you know, if you just mowed the lawn and took care of the place, they left you alone. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that, that is nuts. That is nuts. Um, so, so before we get into some of your highs and some of your lows, it, what would you suggest to anybody if they wanted to, uh, get going? What, 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 how would this, I mean, the way, the way HG network presents, it's just like anybody in a wacky marriage can get together and you have like you, your wife and a handyman friend, and you can just go in and start <laughs> Flipping houses and it and everyone's like, oh, I want to do that. And then it it just seems like the you know the the fee of entry might be a little bit more than people think. Or what what what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know what? I've been there. I've done that with the home flipping, and it, there's a lot that goes into it. Like logistically, I mean, it's tough. It I mean, you're dealing with contractors. You're dealing with Lots of different choices, lots of unknowns that come up during the process. You know, the whole thing is unknowns, pretty much. And I'm not saying you can't make money with it because a lot of people do and a lot of people have, and we we did as well. But I think there's easier ways. Uh, you know, I don't think it's a real beginner way to get involved in real estate investing. They make it look really easy on HGTV and all these shows. And some people really resonate with with that kind of stuff, but I think there's easier ways to invest in that, at least initially um before so you don't have to deal with all that that stuff you know yeah it's crazy so what, what go on what what kind of land do you do you buy you talk about land flipping is it yeah you know what, farmland uh regular you know development what, what are you doing yeah we're doing it all but for, for the most part most of these properties are rural properties five to ten acres plus a lot of them are an hour or two outside of a major met metropolitan area and like I said, I don't deal with properties here in Southern California because the prices are crazy. And most of the good properties are already built on, developed anyhow. But East Coast, Midwest, South, like all of those areas are, are pretty prime for what we do. And our model is set up in a way that we I don't have to go out to any of these properties ever. 
You know, we have a photographer that goes, checks out the properties. We we sell resell, sell things through a broker. It's not, it's not a situation where I ever have to actually go see any of these properties. So I can tell so much from um, just from behind my computer screen what these properties are all about. And uh, yeah, I mean, these are properties that generally would be something that maybe someone would buy as a recreational property, or they might buy it as a potential home site, or they might buy it as something like, hey, I'm going to um, put a mobile home on here or manufactured home and 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 live here, uh, you know, and commute to work whenever I have to, you know, so that that's a lot of our buyers would end up doing something like that. Um, what are, go ahead, Sam. What is the best deal you ever made? What was the best one you, you know, we were just like, oh my god, this is amazing. Yeah, well, there's been a there's been a number of them that have been like that. You know, as far as a profit percentage one, I just actually kind of detailed one that we did on, on a recent podcast episode. As far as profit goes, I think the best return on investment I have is like three hundred twenty percent return in forty four days. So that was a situation, I think on that property, that was a really inexpensive property. So we bought it for 8,000 and we sold it for almost 50,000, I think, or uh, 40 something thousand dollars after, you know, commissions and closing costs and everything like that. And we only held it for 44 days. So that was a really good return. We've had properties where we've made over a hundred thousand in about 30, 40 days, you know, but, you know, we had to invest more in order to make that as well. Yeah. That is nice. Yeah. That's a what good are, return. What do you think the best parts of the country are right now? Yeah, I love the East Coast. East Coast, anywhere, you know, anywhere from kind of the band and New York down to Florida. Uh, there's a lot of good opportunities there. And the Midwest, there's some good stuff, too. I know a lot of people that just focus on states like Texas or Oklahoma, and they, they just find their niche there, and they really learn the areas really well and just do all of their business there. I mean, we do pretty much all over the place, and we love to kind of get great contacts in a certain area and do more and more business in those areas. But there's a lot of opportunity everywhere. I mean, I think there's some states that I probably would stay away from, you know, maybe like Alaska or New Mexico or something like that. But why New Mexico? Part, uh, I just have an aversion to New Mexico. <laughs> <You're> weird. <laughs> Are you just state. old school? You prefer old Mexico? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like the old Mexico better. That's right. <laughs> Some great resorts there. <laughs> Yeah. When do you do you ever like do you ever get a sense where it's like oh man this might go our way really good like is there anything like you know so, uh, to me it's gotta be kind of like gambling right where you're just it is, yeah. you're gambling and then suddenly you're just like oh man i feel it it's this is it yeah. this could be a really good run yeah. what what are the signs where like you're like oh man this might be a good one this might be a a, a real good deal for us yeah, well, we try to figure that out. We try to figure that out during the buying process because it takes a little, a little while to close. You know, we get under contract, then we have a process where we do our due diligence, we call it, and we really research the property in depth. We're getting a, an opinion from a broker. We're getting the photographer out there. And, you know, when the photos come back and it's way nicer than we thought, and the, the broker comes back and says, oh, I think I could sell it for this, which is way more than what you thought. And, uh, yeah, so some of those things really start lining up. And, you know, sometimes... Sometimes it really works out well. I mean, I've had some where they don't work out well. But I've never lost any money yet, uh, knock on wood. But I have some. Well, where that's we... great. How long you've been doing this? What twenty years? Uh, no, just land flipping for about three years now, almost three years. Well, that's still. I mean, yeah. that's amazing. A couple hundred deals. So a couple hundred deals, and it's never gone really. I mean, like horribly bad. I mean, what is the worst? Uh, deal the worst I made. I made five hundred dollars of one. So that's the worst profit percentage. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, still right? not that bad. I mean, yeah. I was yeah. selling cryptos for and making 500 bucks and high five and everybody. I mean, yeah, so that's not that bad. <laughs> that's pretty good. What was that well, deal? Oh, you know, it was, it was one of these deals. Well, there's a couple of them that have been right around there, you know, like 500 to a thousand dollars that I made, you know, like one of them in particular, it was a, it was a property I thought we were actually going to do really well on. And what happened was we just tell we said it, I think we listed it for maybe like 59,000. We bought it for like 20 some thousand. We listed it for 59,000 and we had to keep reducing it because, you know, people would go and see the property and they just weren't interested and they weren't interested. 
come to find, we ended up selling it for, you know, 500 or a thousand dollar profit at the end after holding it for a year and kind of messing around with it for that long. But the problem was that it had road frontage, meaning it had the property was against a public roadway, but there was like a almost like a rock cliff along, along the road. So there's no real way to access the property unless you had dynamite or, you know, some <laughs> ropes to climb up on it. So I should have I should have realized that, you know. But after that, looking at the photographer pictures, but I didn't, you know, I missed it. Is that part of not visiting these properties? Is that kind of one of the downfalls that, and has that happened to you enough to be like, maybe I should come see these properties? I mean, uh, it seems crazy no, to me. It would be, it would be tough for me to, you know, like we always send out someone, you know, we always send out a photographer. I just wasn't paying attention enough. And they put, I mean, <laughs> hindsight, they put it in their notes like, oh, access is really difficult for this property and all this stuff, but I just didn't pay attention. So, you know, what, we, we try to learn our lessons th- about that kind of stuff along the way. What are some of the things you look at that make you want to say this, we're going to buy this thing? What do you look at to purchase a property, a good property? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're looking at the values. You know, we're trying to see like, it's the price that we're paying for this property in relation to what I think we could sell it for. You know, we always try to do a double. That's kind of our rule of thumb. Like if we buy a property for 20,000, we're trying to project that we're going to make 40, you know, sell it for 40,000. That's kind of our thing off the top of uh, my head. But we also look for things that kind of characteristics of quality properties. And those generally are, you know, it's got to have access to a public roadway. So it's got to have great access. It's got to have a topography that is not, you know, on the side of a mountain or something that just makes it undesirable in some way. You know, it can't have like a neighbor that's like a, a city dump site. It can't, ha- you know, it's all these like factors kind of combine to like, oh, okay, this is a nice property or this is a property that no one's want- going to want to buy. So I try to look at things through a potential buyer's lens. You know, what are they going to see? What are, the, what, are the, what objections are they going to have? So, no, so, so you get a big piece of land, but what do you... Ch- what do you? Th- what do most people use this land for? Housing, or do they use it for like commercial? Yeah, most of the time it's just a single family home. If they're if they're going to use it for housing, sometimes some of these people just buy it for recreation. If they're going to, you know, ride uh, side by sides on it, or they're going to use it for, you know, shooting or hunting or something like that. Like some ah, of these people, that's you know, cool. Yeah, but you know, sometimes people just uh, think of it as a potential home site. Like maybe they'll just use it for recreation at first, but then they're thinking, you know, maybe one of these days we'll build a home here. So a lot of that stuff happens too. Then we get a lot of people that just accumulate land in a particular area. You know, I was just going to ask that because, like, you know, I, I live in Los Angeles, and sometimes when I go from the Valley to the Comedy Store, I'll go over. I'll go. I'll use um, Laurel Canyon. It's like a shortcut that everybody uses, but you'll see it's like some of the on the side of the road is just like right up a mountain, but you'll see people selling that part of the mountain. And I'm like, what is the goal? Like, is the goal just to own that land? Cause someday it might be super expensive. Think about the the hills, Sam, Uh, people live on those things on the hills. They just put the houses on stilts. You know, that is crazy to me. Yeah. And you yeah. just see it all the time. You'll be driving, let's say, to Bakersfield, and you just see a giant chunk of land. And I'm like, are, you, yeah. are people just going to buy this and just hold on to it? Yeah, see, that's that's one. That's what I thought land investing was about before. I thought, like, you know, as you're driving to Vegas, you know, in the 15 out to Vegas, you see, like, all these signs of these big, huge parcels for sale. And you're like, you know, maybe someday that property is going to be worth something. Maybe this, you know, that's mm-hmm. going to be, there's going to be development out this way or something like that. And I just thought it was a real long-term game. Like you buy these properties and you just sit on them. You hopefully, you hope that they're in the path of progress. And at, at some point it's going to be worth a whole lot more. So I thought that's what land investing was all about. And, th- and then I just kind of discovered this, this niche that people were doing, which is, are the short-term holds of land, you know, like we're only holding these properties 60 to 90 days on average, sometimes less, you know, sometimes it ends up taking us longer than that, but the whole goal is to sell them fast. So we buy them at a really aggressive price. So then we can put them on the market at a good price to get attention. So they'll sell quickly. Can I, can I ask you how much of what you, 
what you bring to the equation, would you say is sales and marketing and how much of it is identifying properties in good places? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, is it because, I mean, the people who I assume, you know, the banks or whomever own the property when you bought it from, if they had your resources, your contacts, let's say, or your marketing skills, they could have also sold the properties at these prices if they were willing to invest in them how you how you did. So what what would, what percentages would you say are, I, I'm curious, like marketing, your investment in the properties themselves, and then your eye for uh, location? How, yeah, how would you break so that down? Really, really good questions. I should kind of clarify how we get our properties. First of all, we send out all of our, we get uh, all of our leads by sending out direct mail or okay, uh, okay. letters, wow. snail mail to all these people. And these are properties are all off market. These are just owned by people. They may have owned them for a long time. They may have inherited them. You know, they're not on the market. They're not like readily available. To oh, anyone. fascinating. So, okay. Yeah. So we're trying to drum up these deals off market. We actually send them offers in the mail, like an actual offer amount based off of averages for a particular area. And it's an aggressive price too. So, you know, there's only a, a small percentage of people that respond, but the ones that respond, we uh, see if it's a good property when they respond and then we work out a deal. So uh, that's kind of our, that's kind of our thing. It's finding the deals. That's the big, the biggest component of all of this. And we actually hand off the sales and the marketing side of things to a local land broker after we purchase a property. So we try not to get involved in that side of things. We let them kind of take over there and you know, put it into their process. They're the local, they know the area. They've got a lot of buyers in the area. So it generally works out best to do it that way. So yeah. I got a question. What what is the your biggest regret uh on your investment journey? Yeah. Well, uh my biggest mistake was that I got out of real estate investing uh exactly the time that I should have been getting into it. You know, like when the market crashed 2008, uh, we were like, uh, we're out. This oh, that's is, like, how too we... risky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How he loves when the risky. market dumps is like opportunity, <laughs> dude. dude. Yeah. yeah. And I knew it at Love the it. time, you know, it was just a really strange, it was a really strange time. There was, everything was unsettled. And, you know, even at the time I was like, oh, this is going to be worth a lot more in the future. But I didn't have the cash at the time to like buy these properties. And there wasn't a lot of private money floating around at that time either to pick up these deals. So it was, it, it was a weird time. Uh, but I should have found a way to been accumulating properties back then. And instead, I just kind of like threw up my hands and said, oh, you know, I I'm going to just figure, see how the dust settles and, you know, go from there. But I should have been backing up the truck and figured out how to buy whatever properties I could at that point in time. Because anyone that did, especially in Southern California, I mean, they're they made out pretty well. <laughs> So what if I like, what if I go buy like one of these like $10,000 houses in Detroit? Do you think that's a bad idea? Probably. Yeah. Detroit's losing population. Yeah. And plus, you know, what, what are you going to do with it? You know, are you going to rent it out? Are you going to try to flip it? Um, you know, if you're going to try to flip it, you'll probably have a lot of renovation costs and then you're going to be, you know, maybe the numbers will work out. You probably don't have a team in Detroit, you know, that, that you trust that can renovate the home for you. Uh, you know, I've tried that before as well. I, I bought a home in, this is way back when, before the market crashed, way back when I bought one in Buffalo. And I think I bought a $20,000 house and I was like, oh, this is going to be a home run. We're going to sell it for, huh. you know, 50, 60,000. Contractor ran away with half the money, didn't do the work. You know, oh, it's just a no. big, you know. We ended up actually getting out of the property and I think it was a wash, but it was just a pain in the butt. And is Buffalo not what I, I was just in Buffalo. I love Buffalo. It's in, oh, yeah. It's I mean, at the time, at the time, prices were really low there. And I think I I think I got the idea because I used to look on eBay because you could find cool properties for sale on eBay. And I saw in Buffalo, the prices were really cheap. And then I called an agent there and he found this deal for me. You know, the information wasn't the same. There was no Zillow. There was none of this stuff. So I had to rely on what he was back in me. my day. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. You know? And it was only 2008, not that long ago, but yeah. You know. <laughs> I, I know a guy that in 2009 bought shit. He bought like five homes in Buffalo uh, and sold them five years later and doubled, doubled his money. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's one of those things. I mean, that's, that was the time to be buying. I mean, there's always deals around, but. 
That's my biggest well, regret. <laughs> what is uh what's the the biggest and most outrageous goal for your business? What what is your biggest craziest yeah, well, goal? Well, our biggest goal was to do is to do 10 million in revenue this year. I don't know if we're going to hit it, but uh we're at about uh 4 million and some change now, Let's but I've got go. some big deals closing. Yeah. I got some big deals closing coming up. So that's kind of the biggest goal on the table right now. And uh, even if I don't hit it, I think I'll come pretty close and next year try to double it. So, so, so let's say this show wanted to start investing in real estate. How much capital do you think we need to start off? Yeah, well, there's ways to do it without capital. Uh, and you're, are you talking about homes or land or what do you, what are you well, thinking? We'll start with land. Cause that's kind of what you've been talking about. Flipping land. Yeah. Like if we, yeah. if the three of us were like, let's go in together, let's start flipping land. Let's be land flippers. Um, how much do you think we need? Yeah. So the big thing you need is a budget for marketing and we spend a lot of money in direct mail. So if you invest your money into direct mail to actually generate those deals, then funding the deals is not an issue. As long as hold you on, get the hold deal on, hold locked on. up. What do you mean by that? You mean you send out a mass mail going, hey, do you want to sell? Or or do you send it out going, hey, this is for sale? Yeah, you just send out letters to home, to uh, property owners. You know, you compile a list of property owners, say 10 acres plus in this particular county or area. And then you give them an actual offer price on the letter. And uh, it's an actual offer that you send them, one pager. It's very simple. And some people respond. Some people will sign it and send it back. Uh, some people will call you up and, you know, tell you how you're you're trying to rip them off because the price is so low and that type of thing. So you get that type of response too sometimes. But it generates lots of uh, lots of responses. And you just have to kind of sort through the good ones and get under contract with the good ones and close those deals and then resell them. The offers you're saying though, aren't actionable, right? Like even if they did sign them, it would still require further steps. It would still require my signature. Okay, yeah. Okay, because okay. I don't send them out signed. I yeah, just send I them you. out, okay. you know? Yeah. So we have to review the deal when it comes back. Cause we, yeah, you know, okay. we're sending out a huge quantity. So yeah, we can't I look at all these yeah, properties. Yeah. yeah. So people, so, people might well think that like, Hey, it's sold. When they send it yeah. in signed, I assume. Yeah, they okay. might, yeah, they might think that. But. What What is the largest deal you ever made doing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest one we've done so far was we bought a property for three fifteen, sold it for five ninety five. Mm. That was a pretty good one. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was like a six hundred some acre property. <laughs> Yeah. What kind of land was that? We, we've got water on it. What are we talking here? No, was no, it? it was just in the south and it had um it was like all pine trees. It was actually a really oh. um, beautiful property, I think. Um, just like wooded property, like all six hundred some acres of it. it had you know roads and stuff going through the property, just kind of a rural area. Like very you ever rural get involved area, with but... people that have a mind to uh what do you mean romantically? Lumber, a mind toward the lumber. Uh they want the lumber. Is that is that something that ever happens? Yeah, yeah. People do timber investments, and I think actually that suit the buyer of that property what they what they thought they were going to do it. Just hold it as an investment property, and then you know with those timber type properties, they're kind of like renewable type things. So yeah. they'll every twenty years or so they'll cut the timber and then they'll plant new ones, and you know wait yeah I, we get offers and... on that all the time on the farm. Oh, yeah. And yeah, yeah, and and I, I've been getting texts. I have a few parcels out here that I inherited from my grandfather and I get these random texts, you know, like, Hey, we just want to know if you want to sell your property. And I assume it's somebody in a, in the similar business to you, but that does yeah. like text messages instead of direct mail. I yeah, get those all the time. That's another way to generate business. You know, some people do the text messaging. Um, our, our thing is like the direct mail. So just another way to do things. Just another way to drum up deals, I guess. Mm, so sure. the, yeah. first, the first email you send out is basically, you know, let us know if you'd be interested in selling the property. You don't put numbers on the first email, do you? Uh, mail. Yeah, we do. We put an actual offer amount on there. So, so you got to send out a lot of different specific emails because I'm sure there's different prices. Well, we send out actual letters in the mail. So, um, oh, oh, hard. Copy. Yeah. <laughs> so, old yeah, school, and, bro. Yeah, this is snail mail. This is, uh, <laughs> 
So the, the thing is, we look at a particular county, say, for instance, a lot of times we break it down by the county in a certain state, and we'll look at the sale prices in that area, and we'll say, okay, retail is about 10000 an acre, for instance. We might offer them 3000 an acre, uh, 4000 an acre, something like that. So then they respond, and it's just a mail merge thing. Like We know the amount of acres they have. Uh, we know that the the price per acre we want to offer them. So the offer will go out and they'll say 30 or 40,000, you know, depending on what the case is. And then it starts the conversation from there. Sometimes they respond and they've got a nice property and they're like, hey, I, I want to sell, but the price is too low. And then we look at it and we're like, okay, we can come up with some to put this deal together. And that's, hmm. you know, that's how those things work. What would you say percentage, just ballpark figures, percentage wise, how many do you get any response on, would you say, even if it's a negative response? Yeah, I don't. I don't typically. Uh, I don't typically track the response rate because there's a whole lot of variables that go on with that. But I. Uh-huh. But what I do track is the, the cost per deal, and okay. that is that's typically about three thousand dollars per deal in mail cost. So each letter costs me about fifty okay. cents. Yeah, so it's about one deal every six thousand offers that we send out. So, wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. But, All right. Final question. A lot of work. Uh, what is the best thing about being a real estate investor? What's your favorite thing about it? I love the, I love the action of it. I love getting deals. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a like you mentioned it earlier about gambling. It's I'm not a gambler cause I always lose. So I, I've never really been addicted to that, but I do love finding great deals. I love buying great properties. I, I love all that. So I love the action of it. I mean, I think the best part is uh, how profitable it can be and how it's not a situation where I've got to be, you know, I, I've built a team around me so I don't have to like be there, uh, do every single step of the whole process. So that's what's what's great to me. So and just, uh, awesome, you know, it's man. exciting to me because you never know what's going to come in and what kind of deal is going to be next. We all have that inner degenerate. You got to find a way to bring it out, baby. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay, let, one more question. Where where are some um like what's the most exciting area for you in the country right now? Where where are you going? Okay, there's some nice deals around here. Yeah. Well, uh people love Florida. I I have I have had a, a limited success in Florida. Lots of people do, you know, land deals in Florida. There's a lot of action there. I think it's pretty competitive though. So, but I like I like this I like the southeast. Those are my favorite areas really, you know. Uh, pretty much in like Virginia down to, you know, Georgia, something like that. That's kind of my favorite Is just area. the entire country going to live in the Southeast? It just seems like maybe. that's yeah. where everybody's moving. I just think they want to get everybody out of California, flip it over, make it into these smart cities and all that stuff where they, they own everything. And then we're all just crammed into Florida and Georgia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of land down in the South though. There's plenty of room. A lot of land. Oh, yeah. 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 Fly over Florida and see. It's just, I mean, seriously empty. Yeah. You drive from Atlanta to Savannah and basically it's three and a half hours of just land. Yeah. I mean, where was I? I was somewhere. I'm like, I can't believe everyone thinks there's too many people. It's like, there's uh, so much land. There's just so much land. It's unbelievable. And hopefully everyone can get a piece of it, invest. Flip it, make your money. Peter, thank you for coming on. One yeah. more time, please tell them where they can find you uh, and you, about your podcast and where our listeners can find you. Yeah, okay, well, great. Um, first of all, uh, if you want to learn how to flip land, I've got a whole free community and free training program on that. And to find that, that would be at landconquest.com. It's my shirt here, actually. So, oh. and that's, uh, we've got a community of people that are, brand new into land flipping and, and lots of experienced land flippers as well. And I've got a whole free training program, which I, I created for that community. So that's at landconquest.com. And then also our podcast is called the Turning Profit Podcast. And you can find that wherever you can listen to podcasts, just search for Turning Profit. Also, you can find uh, us on YouTube at Turning Profit. And then I've got a website, uh, turningprofit.com where each month I do a monthly income report, which shows you exactly what land flips deals we did that month, you know, like the 
the revenue, the gross profit, each and every deal that we did, like what we bought it for, what we sold it for, the acres, the you know, story about what happened with that property. So really try to spend a lot of time on that. that content. So just to see, show people what's pop possible in the in the business. So I love that. I love that. Well, this has been a great interview. We appreciate you coming on. Look forward to having you back again. And uh, yeah, man, let's do it soon, Peter. Thanks for coming Sounds on. Sounds great. Well, thanks a lot for having me, guys. I really appreciate yeah, thank it. You. It was good. Great, you, greatly yeah. appreciate it. Take care, brother. Yeah. yeah. All right, Peter. Thank you for coming on. That was great. Uh, yeah. My wheels are spinning. Uh, wheels. I want to figure it out. Buy some land. Get in it. Flip it. Wheels not are turning. Become, yes. Not become wheel. emotionally Damn, attached to it. Anyways. What stuff. else we got? Let's do some business. Hey, look, big thing, big news today, man. Two companies uh got added to the S and P five hundred. So, you know that happens. They'll take two shitty companies out. They'll add two good ones, and and they added today Airbnb. Uh, right on. Seven points got added to the S and P. That's huge news for them. And uh, Sam's other favorite company, Blackstone, got added to the S and P. Um, so you know you'll see this every now and then. About time. They'll take shitty companies out, put good ones in. And, you know, if you own the S&P 500 index, which a lot of people do, uh, you know, you got to be happy with that. That's How does that work when you own an index fund? Do they offload those shares slowly, the ones that are outgoing? Or do they, is that something they do all at once? You think, how, how does that work? Yeah, they, I, they pretty much, I think they do it over o, over time. I mean, I don't know, a few days. They probably don't want to tank the price, you know, just dump all their shares. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, I don't think it's it's that. You got to remember, I don't know how much they actually own. There's five, it's probably a formula, right? Things. They probably have a formula for it. Like, okay, yeah. the five hundred uh, stocks in in that index fund. That's a lot of stocks, man. No, no, I mean they don't want to take the price of the stock that they're dumping the shares. If they have like a ton of shares of it, you know what I'm saying? It could. Uh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. In the fund, they don't care. Yeah, man, it's interesting. They, they, yeah, because you got to remember something. They'll sell it. Someone's gonna buy it. I mean, you're always going to have a buyer. This might be the biggest story of the week. And I know because it's affected. Everybody knows somebody who's affected like this. It's like COVID uh, or AIDS in the 90s. Disney is pushing charter uh, Spectrum customers to go to Hulu Live TV because of this contract dispute. They've pulled ESPN and these other channels. Yeah, Johnny. This is crazy. Utah. Uh, the football game last week, uh, kickoff's 8 o'clock. I'm sitting there. I'm watching the coaches on the sideline, the players. I'm all pumped up uh, <laughs> to watch the game. And they go to a commercial break. They come back, and all there is is a blank screen. Are you kidding? They did it in right before the game started? Oh, One my God. The game. 7.59, right before that tip. That is crazy. That is so incredibly and, stupid. And I'll tell you, I did a lot of research on this shit. And, you wow. know, May Spectrum writes it across the top is Disney would not take our con- – blame the whole thing on Disney. Yeah, yeah. And I'll that tell you it. what, I talked to some dudes that work at Spectrum, and they said, nah, fuck no, we fucked up. They, I mean, supposedly really? Spectrum had a bullshit deal that was ridiculous. And Disney uh-huh. said, fuck you. So it's going to crush Spectrum. It, well, I mean, it's it's going to fuck both sides because a giant part of Spectrum is the Los Angeles market. And we couldn't watch all of these huge games. Yes. That, I know. Like, do, uh, Disney can say whatever the fuck they want, but good luck going to your advertisers when you're like, hey, man. Yeah. I mean, who actually sells the ads? Is it? Disney or is it Spectrum? Well, the hmm. I it mean, depends on where they're going. I guess it would be the Spectrum. It would be Disney that the channels, the individual ABC channels, sell the local sell ads. Their ads or does Spectrum yeah. sell ads on Spectrum ABC? Spectrum would not sell their ads. On, no, yeah, so Disney fucked up, man. Yeah. When they didn't allow us to see uh, Florida versus LSU, it was uh, no, it was Florida Utah. That was the game. No, Florida State, excuse me. Florida, Utah. And I'll tell you what, there's one area that benefited like crazy. Uh, and that was every local bar and restaurant in the <laughs> fucking country. Because there was a lo- there's a local shit restaurant in the town I was in. You might see one or two people in there on a on an average night. 
the place was packed within 30 minutes. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Nobody that's could cool. watch it. So you had to go because they have direct TV. And you can you can and you can see the game on direct TV. Uh, now, hey, I got a question about YouTube television and the NFL package. Can I just buy the NFL package or do I gotta buy YouTube TV too? I think you have to get the YouTube TV thing too. Yeah. Fuck. It, I so mean, like it, if I, I gotta have Spectrum. I mean, it's 450 and... bucks, though. So. What? No, you don't have to have Spectrum. You would just no, have to I get... have Spectrum. So I gotta oh, have okay. Spectrum yeah. and YouTube TV. I would assume so. Let me see. Uh that's I have YouTube week. TV TV and it's got a shitload of games on, man. I love it. I love it. YouTube Let's see. TV. You can get NFL t- Sunday ticket on YouTube for uh, the current promo price of two ninety nine, or bundle NFL Red Zone with NFL Sunday ticket on YouTube TV for forty dollars more. Uh, keep in mind that NFL Sunday ticket on YouTube TV requires a YouTube TV base plan. A YouTube TV base plan is seventy two ninety nine per month. Oh my god. Oh, I'm gonna be illegally I streaming had to get it again. To get the investment, I'm gonna be illegally streaming again. Yeah, I'm not paying. I mean, like, $300. So I got paid what four hundred dollars plus seventy dollars a month. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh my god, I'm not doing it. Fuck. One it. last I thing it. I wanted to hit uh, before we go to uh, how he's picks. Uh, Goldman uh, lowered their recession chances to fifteen percent. Now I always love to look at their little projections. Uh, in a note, oh, that's titled, good. In a note titled Soft Landing Summer, uh, released on Monday, Goldman Sachs chief economist uh, Jan Hatsius said uh, there's a 15% chance of a recession in the next 12 months. That's down from uh, 20% and higher uh, from earlier projections. So good news there. Yeah, Goldman Sachs, out of everybody, they, they are goddamn positive on everything. They're saying that AI... Any AI related stock is a buy right now, even though they're extremely high. They say there's not a bubble. It's going to go on for years and years. <laughs> Omen's positive, man. Not everyone else is, but they are. Yeah. So uh, I, I'll give you some some justification for it if you want. The continued positive inflation and labor market news has led us to cut our our estimated twelve month recession prob- probability. So they're basing on that plus the uh, the resilience of the economy, which is sounds like bullshit to me, but uh, yeah, yeah, income yeah. growth looks good. They say job growth is significant. Yeah. By uh, the way, uh, all the jobs that Joe Biden has uh, added are only fans and bare knuckle fighters. Well, it's so, funny because this says that at the same time, the labor market has gotten more balanced or rebalanced. That, that part's true, man. You know what I, is I that? About- what, do you, what does that mean? Sounds. Sounds good. Dude, like it's not just right it's now. not just bad jobs and good jobs, you know, like the the ends. It's a little it's bit of everything. Middle. Yeah. And it's I down. Mean, it was 35% their projection in March, 25% in June, 20, and now 15. The economy overall right now is goddamn solid, man. It is. Unemployment's fairly low. 4.3. Uh, yeah. Dollar. The dollar hit an all-time high again today. It's like 104, 105. Uh the green. It's like 3.8%. Unemployment. Yeah. I mean, people are working. I mean, wages are still decent. Uh, it, it, You know, it, it could be a hell of a lot worse. Not that bad right now. It really isn't. Um, stock market's a little too high. I'd like to see it sell off a little bit, make me feel healthier, but that's about it, man. We're in All good right. shape. What are you looking at this week, Howie? Pigs. Look, I, I normally, I changed my pick at the last second, four o'clock today, because uh, natural, you know, oil and oil and energy is through the roof. Uh, but natural gas dropped five and a half percent today. It's down to in UNG. UNG is down to six dollars sixty four cents. I think it bounces off of that this week. I really like UNG at six sixty four right here. Right on. All right, we ready to go over to the Patreon. Let's go scene. to the Patreon where friends hang out and talk. Patreon.com/slash. Cash Daddies. <laughs>